Today we're talking about the recent Supreme Court case of Animal Science Products versus Hebei Welcome Pharmaceuticals. Wow, an animal testing company suing a Chinese pharmaceutical manufacturer? How am I going to make this funny? This case is following in the footsteps of such greats as Alien vs Predator, Godzilla vs Mechagodzilla, and Freddy vs Jason. Except now we've escalated to real monsters. So what happened in this case of Big Pharma vs Animal Testing? Well, this case was really about whether Chinese companies can violate US antitrust laws when selling products in America. Now, the answer here might seem so obvious that you're probably looking at the runtime of this episode and wondering, how is this guy going to fill the rest of this piece? But think about it for a second. Antitrust laws prevent conspiring to fix the price and quantity of products, which while might be good for some, definitely is not aligned with the Chinese brand. China's Communist Party had extreme influence over the costs of production and prices for Chinese products. Yeah, price and quantity setting, while it has diminished in recent years, is still definitely a thing in the Chinese economy. Which raises the question, if antitrust laws are to be believed, can we fundamentally not continue to do business with China? No, they haven't released the statement yet, but I'm fairly confident the answer will be no. Now first, and man do I get tired of saying this, but no news sources have covered this case because we're too busy covering the looming trade war with China. Wait, what? I guess we could have slipped it in somewhere. Anyways, in this specific case, Animal Science Products was trying to buy vitamin C from Chinese companies and claimed that they were coordinating their quantities and prices using the Chinese Chamber of Commerce. Wow, the Chinese companies, never denying this, said that it is Chinese law that they must coordinate their prices and quantities through that Chamber of Commerce. Alright, so now that we know that, let's jump right in. Argument next in case 161220. Animal Science Products versus Hebe Welcome Pharmaceutical. I realize that we did just jump right in, but let's swim to the shallow section for a second. Because there are a few more details we need to cover, like, unlike previous cases we've talked about, the rulings of lower courts actually play into this case in a major way. First, this went to the District Court, which awarded $147 million to Animal Science Projects. Which, I'm not super OCD, but come on, can we just round that up to $150 million? So then China appealed to the Second Circuit Court because, well, if we had $147 million every time they broke a trade law, we might be debt free by June. The Second Circuit Court looked at the case and reversed it on international comedy grounds, which, ironically, is not funny at all. Comedy is the deference that is given to foreign institutions, not as a matter of law, but as a matter of policy. Basically, it's the idea of, eh, we'll agree to disagree, and we will weigh in on how you do your things if you don't do the same with us. The problem here is that, as you can imagine, when a communist and a capitalist meet to discuss trade, well, I'd clear my schedule to the end of next year because this is going to take a little while. In this case, what was illegal in America was mandated in China, so in theory, it would be pretty dicky to sue a Chinese company for adhering to the law of the land. Alright, so now let's actually get into it. One of those costs is the independence of the judiciary to decide questions that are before them. U.S. courts should not give up their responsibility to say what the law is in cases and controversies before them, even when that law is foreign. And courts in this country have been uh, interpreting and construing foreign law for two centuries and not outsourcing that task uh, to other entities simply because those questions are difficult. First, and I know it's a small thing, but it's 2018. How have we not figured this one out yet? All right, so should the U.S. defer to other countries' laws if they're reasonable? Well, we could stick to the old strategy of bombing countries who don't agree with until an ally emerges from the rubble, but what should our judges do when it's China? Well, there are different approaches. First, we have to look at... We actually do outsource uh, saying what the law is sometimes in domestic law. Uh, Chevron, for example. Um, we uh, give conclusive weight to a determination by an agency as to what the law is. So why, as a matter of comedy, wouldn't we do the same to 
an administrative agency of a foreign sovereign. All right. So first, let's break down that Chevron doctrine because they mentioned it so many times. I thought Chevron was the unofficial sponsor. So let's go back to the 1984 case of Chevron versus National Resource Defense Council. All right. So it's 1977 and Congress just amended the Clean Air Act. Because, surprisingly, at one point in our history, clean air wasn't a partisan issue. The House is in the Committee of the Whole House and the State of the Union for the consideration of the Bill H.R. 6161, a bill to amend the Clean Air Act and for other purposes. This act was set to help states that didn't attain air quality standards. They would have to implement a permitting program for all new or modified major producers of dirty air. Then comes a scandal, in a twist that shocked the world of administrative law junkies the world over. Both of them. Under Carter, the rule was interpreted to mean that any new or modified air toxifying entity would have to face this permit caper. You know, what the act said. Well, then Reagan come along, and we all know how much he loved environmental protection. He had his eyes on protecting a different green. Well, he announced Ann Gorsuch, the mother of now Supreme Court Judge Neil Gorsuch, if that name sounded familiar, and she had a slightly different interpretation of the act. You know the part where it says new or modified polluters need permits. Well, she saw it as you can do whatever you want and buy additions that don't meet our standards, as long as your overall output doesn't increase. Which, while making sense logically, really, really is not what that amendment said. I like the part where you have to file permits for all new pollutant producers and modifications. I really do. But what if you don't have to file permits if your overall output shouldn't go up? Well, sounds great. Should we take that to Congress? No, nah, let's just start doing it. So anyways, the National Resource Defense Council sued the EPA, saying that they couldn't do that, and won. Although, in a completely not suspicious turn of events, Chevron appealed the case on behalf of the EPA. Which, wow, when Chevron is coming to the EPA's defense, well, that should set off all sorts of alarm balls. That's like Goldman Sachs campaigning for Bernie Sanders. Well, Q. Gentlemen, the case is submitted. We'll hear arguments next in Chevron against uh, Natural Resources Council. Chevron won that case for the EPA, creating the Chevron Doctrine that lawyers are talking about applying to the Chinese case we're talking about today. The Chevron Doctrine has two steps, or Yes, NYU's graduate law school made an entire music video about it, because of course an NYU student would look at administrative law and think, you know what this needs? More pizzazz. Linking to it right here though because it's pretty darn catchy. So anyways, the Chevron 2 step. First, you have to see if Congress has directly and clearly spoken to the precise issue in question. If Congress has unambiguously declared something, then game over. That's what you're doing. But if Congress hasn't directly addressed the specific change in interpretation, then we head over to step 2. Is what you're doing reasonable or permittable? Basically, don't propose stupid things under the Fed defense. Hey, it's technically legal. If both of those tests have passed, well, then you can come up with your own statutory interpretations. Alright, so what would that look like when applied to China? Well, going back to our current case. The Chevron Doctrine has a number of sort of gatekeeping steps or preconditions before this court would even consider the reasonableness of an agency's interpretation. And so, for example, Chevron step zero and step one. Well, that, all that suggests is perhaps we, we should import a similar regime here. That would be quite a holding of this court, uh, uh, Justice Gorsuch. It would require this court to invent rules for how a court is to determine, for example, what arm of a foreign sovereign is authoritative and how that foreign sovereign arm exercises its We'd have to set up new rules to apply this internationally, which of course just swoon the Supreme Court because they like creating large books of rules more than a German board game manufacturer. So if we were to go to the Chevron route with all of this, well, Congress has never spoken about Chinese companies obeying our antitrust laws. Because, despite everything you might assume about Congress, even they don't have that much of a god complex. 
So this brings us to the question number two, question of reasonability, which is a bit trickier than you might think because. So if the United States went to a to a, another government, let's play, let's pick France just to get out of the picking governments. Wow, you're trying to give us an example of a country America might be more sympathetic towards and you go with France? Good luck, buddy. Anyways, go on. And said to them that um, what, what happened in the United States was consistent with the rule of reason under Section 1 of the Sherman Act. And for some reason, that's directly relevant to France, French law. If the French, if a French court were to come back and say, wait a second, I read your Section 1 that says all restraints of trade are illegal, and you come and tell me about rule of reason. I read your cases as saying there are per se illegalities, and you come here telling me about rule of reason. I doubt. I mean, the, the notion that this was a respectful analysis of, of China's, and you know, when you say at the end, this is a post hoc attempt to shield somebody's behavior, that's not respect. That's the opposite of respect. All right. So he went into a lot of things there. First, this court did talk about respect more than a scene in The Godfather where you can go in the bathroom without pausing. What is the definition of respect? How can one be more respectful? It got pretty meta. I don't understand this constant em emphasis on respectful. Uh, it doesn't mean that you can't disagree, right? I mean, you know, with all due respect, usually means the person's about to say you're, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Uh, respectfully, Your Honor. Uh. <laughs> but yeah, they basically agreed not to be dicks to other countries when you're having legal disagreements. There, just saved you 20 minutes. The real question is, what was the motivating factor? Because as the lower court wrote, it was a post hoc attempt to hide someone's behavior. Which, well, that would fall into the unreasonable camp. On the other hand, China's representative presented these collusion meetings in a different light. He provided two reasons for why, maybe, these were reasonable and permittable, which would mean that the US Congress should defer to the Chinese Chamber of Commerce regarding Chinese trade laws. First, one, the, the idea that this is entirely voluntary and, and not mandated is completely contradicted by the language in the 2002 and 2003 regulations, which use the word shall repeatedly, use the word must. Uh, it, it's clearly uh, in, in that context uh, uh, mandatory. Yeah, things in China tend to be more compelled than voluntary. So what does this mean? Well, if the US were to find that Chinese laws were fundamentally in need of changing, we wouldn't just write President Xi an email saying, hey, we don't like your trade policies, so if you could just change them so that things are more favorable to us, that would be great. No, we'd sue the companies, like we did in this case, but the fact that they are compelled to collude rather than voluntarily working together really makes things harder. Second. A point that we really haven't uh, addressed sufficiently. What happened from 1997 to 2001 is that the regulatory regime in 1997 failed. It, it, uh, it led to a price war in 2001 that was very destructive to the Chinese economy. The idea that China would then change the regulatory system to one in which uh, price fixing is, is not uh, mandated would result in lower prices, not higher prices, and what China was trying to achieve was higher prices. If you could believe it, at one point things that were made in China were actually cheaper. A price war between entities in the early 2000s really wrecked their economy. And could you imagine a price war nowadays? If those watches get any cheaper, they'll be paying me to take them. The argument here is that these companies are colluding to keep the prices up. So this was implemented to be good for their economy rather than terrible for the US economy. Maybe that's reasonable, maybe that's not. But it's not the only solution to this problem, because we could also take it to the World Trade Organization. The right answer for that problem is if the government's got a problem with it, take it up with the World Trade Organization and, and let that organization deal with those issues. Boy oh boy would that save us a lot of time and confusion. Although, there might be a few problems there too, because... You guys negotiate among yourselves, come up with a price, 
Tell us what it is, and then we will enforce that price. And that's the approach that we took. That's what we said to the WTO. So that when we said that we had abandoned export administration, we did as to certain elements. But what we never said to them, and what it was absolutely clear from the entire submission, is that we maintained minimum export price requirements. Wow, you're not going to be subtle at all. I mean, come on. You're testifying in front of the Supreme Court. You could at least give us the respect of lying or being a little more coy about your plans, rather than just laying them out like a Bond villain. The real problem though is that maintained minimum export price requirements, that those were retained throughout, and the United States, in its submission to the WTO, specifically said, quoting our language, that China retained minimum price requirements, and that that's the rule in place, and that was the rule in place. Why, George Bush? Why? Well, it might be hard to argue that we changed our mind on the ethics of Chinese trade policy, but hey, between Bush, Obama, and Trump, I think our company has literally held every opinion a nation can have in 10 years. This might be tricky, but who knows, the US has plenty of good lawyers. The final way we could handle this is a weird one that came up a few times. Say they're like a state. I'm sorry if Texas Supreme Court says this is the law of Texas. I don't care what somebody else says. That is what the law of Texas is, whether they held the exact opposite yesterday or not. Yeah, I think every time someone hears that clip, Chuck Norris gains a beard hair. So while that might be a little bit of an overstatement of the power of Texas, the sentiment is still there. Give China the rights of a state. Which is always a great thing to suggest for a country with a pretty recent history of colonization. The basic idea, though not fully developed, was that Justice Gorsuch's question indicates we always accept the law of the state Supreme Court as being the law of the state. This is a weird idea that went really underdeveloped in this discussion, but using a state framework to handle these problems seems to be, in the mind of the justices, completely deferring legal authority to countries. As of now, we're not sure how this case will go, but it is significant to a lot more than just even China's trade policy, because we have uh, nearly a thousand federal judges. The, by and large, the characteristic of a federal judge is he knows very little, if anything, about the law of 192 countries. And so what precisely should we write in this opinion? It can't be no matter what, except what they say. But my goodness, if you open the door, I mean, how, how is this to be done? So uh, that's why respectful deference, I don't know if that's the right <laughs> phrase. So I, and I, I don't know if defer if it's reasonable. Reasonable seems to open it. So what are the words that these 900 judges are going to follow when they get in, uh, submissions uh, from the highest legal authorities? in 192 countries without producing some kind of international chaos. Yeah, this would determine a lot of how we handle countries' laws across the globe that get legally challenged in our courts. Which brings me to the question, how has this not come up in the last 200 years? I'll let you know what happens when the decision is released, but until then, thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hey YouTube, if you want to support independent journalism investigating the Supreme Court, subscribe to our YouTube channel for our weekly Supreme Court Saturday episodes. Subscribe now and you can still be in our first 100 subscribers. And as always, leave me a comment if you think you have an important case that I should research. And as always, thank you for watching.